Welcome to DMV Spotlight here in the nation's capital where we shine a light on the issues impacting D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. I'm Barbara Britt. And one of the issues that continues to impact all of our communities is domestic violence. October, as you may know, is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And joining me today is Montgomery County State's Attorney John McCarthy. Thank you so much for joining me today on DMV Spotlight. Uh, Well, it's, it's an honor to be with you. Well, I know that Montgomery County, like a lot of our neighboring counties, has done a lot of work to try to to try to combat domestic violence, to raise awareness, to make sure that resources are available. Uh, but really, let's start with with what I would call the grim statistics. And then they are sad numbers. In Maryland last year, 58 people lost their lives to domestic violence. Uh, 76 percent of those deaths were caused by a handgun. And while domestic violence crosses all socioeconomic boundaries, all ethnic and gender biases, uh, there is a stark statistic that 60% of the domestic violence in our most recent year, 2021, for which we have a complete year of statistics, were African-American women. And do we have any idea um, why that is? Has there been, or has there not even been time for that kind of research? I don't know that there's been time for, for that uh, type of research. I think, look, I, I think all of us who are interested in the topic of domestic violence uh, during COVID, when we were on lockdown, became patently, uh, it became patently obvious to us that while most statistical categories, most statistical categories, as we isolated, went down in terms of numbers of complaints and number of cases, unfortunately, uh, domestic violence numbers among intimate partners, uh, or, or family members uh, that were locked down in COVID, our domestic violence numbers, uh, not only in Montgomery County, not only in Maryland, but nationwide, uh, seem to go up. That's why even during the COVID uh, shutdown, we did lots of public announcements and uh, outreach to the community to make sure that they knew the courts were uh, operating. If someone wanted to get a protective order or wanted to file a complaint against an individual who had assaulted them, uh, the women's shelters and the shelters were open. The Family Justice Center was open. And th- those uh, those are the linchpin uh, service centers that exist here in Montgomery County that were open during COVID, remain open today. And all of those services are free. Uh, the county's made a huge investment in, 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 in addressing the issue of domestic violence. And uh, we have the Family Justice Center, which is located in Rockville that houses 40 public-private agencies working in concert with one another to provide services to victims of domestic violence. And unfortunately, many of those victims bring with them their children. So we are protecting both the victim as well as their children. As proportionately, uh, those that we are providing services to are women. Uh, domestic violence, sadly, is a crime by a large percentage, is perpetrated by men against women. Uh, there are male victims as well, uh, but that, 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 that's a, a small segment of the population that we serve. And I know that the Family Justice Center does provide so many services, State's Attorney John McCarthy, um, including legal services, certainly um, in various languages, helping Uh, families that are trying to escape domestic violence, providing uh, contacts with shelter, with any other things that might be needed. And the Family Justice Center was busy last year. Uh, It it was extremely busy last year. And and again, one of the the hurdles we had during uh, COVID, the COVID shutdown for most of the country was letting people know who were in isolation uh, that we were there and we were still open for business. And Again, you mentioned we do have lots of public-private partners. We do have, uh, you know, uh, the Abused Persons Program. We have Health and Human Services from Montgomery County. We have the Sheriff's Department, the Police Department, my office. Uh, we have the House of Ruth. We have Catholic Charity. You know, a lot of people that come to us, we want to assist them in whatever way they feel is the best way to uh, to make them and, and their family safe. Uh there are, in many instances, the immigration consequences for some of the individuals that come to us. Uh, we provide information to anyone who's a victim of d- d- domestic violence, uh, regardless of their immigration status. And we can uh, give them advice. And there are groups that 
that uh, volunteer their time with us uh, to give them advice about immigration consequences and avenues they could pursue there. Uh, there are people that uh, also, you know, we're, we're basically trying to remove the barriers that keep people trapped in domestic violence. And sometimes it's housing, sometimes it's food insecurity because they're terrified. How am I going to keep a roof over my kid's head and feed them if I leave? Uh, we do try to deal with all of those issues. And because of the public partnership that we have with so many private industries and with the community and the monies that we raise through a charitable foundation, we're able to give them both public assistance, private assistance uh, about both civil and criminal matters and immigration issues if that's applicable to them. And let me ask you, um, what happens, we don't hear a lot in the news, I know there's a lot of privacy concerns and issues, but we don't hear a lot about domestic abusers. Tell us what happens with them on the court side where you are. Well, we, uh, I will tell you, we have uh, for a long time uh, followed a model that it was designed to uh, kind of address the issue of the cycle of domestic violence. Uh, in most instances, and this is something that people who have been interested in this issue have struggled, struggled with for decades, you have an incident that occurs today. You have a victim who reaches out to the authorities for their help. But in the, uh, in the cycle that is domestic violence that is well documented, there is oftentimes a honeymoon period that follows before the court date comes up. In many instances, we have the challenge, one of the challenges we have is convincing victims of crime to actually cooperate with us and holding their abuser responsible for the abuse. Uh, now, one of the ways we combat that is we, we have sort of like a victimless prosecution model where when an act of domestic violence occurs, we investigate the case, try to gather as much information as we possibly can with the assumption that when it comes to the time of the trial, we may not have the victim actually cooperating with us. That, sadly, is something uh, that has traditionally occurred in a lot of these cases um, for a whole variety of reasons that I think that are understandable. But so what happens is you assume that you're not going to have the victim, so you make sure you get the 911 calls. You record the excited utterances. You take photographs. You make sure you get the hospital records if the person needs hospital, assist, hospital assistance. You make sure you document who the witnesses are and get uh, statements from them. Uh, and, and many times you'll actually record statements from the victims early on. What I would characterize as like an excited utterance that we could get into court uh, that is very damning to the defendant. But the, uh, the victim, for whatever reason, may change their testimony by the time we get to trial. But we're going to go forward because we want to take this is about power and control and domestic violence. And one of our objectives is to take the power away from the abuser. Because the abuser may be able to control, based on the dynamics of domestic violence, the person they're abusing, they cannot control uh, the state attorney's office. They can't control the agencies that are trying to now give assistance uh, to someone who has maybe been a victim once, twice, three times. And we're going to try to break the cycle of domestic violence uh, through the efforts that we make here in Montgomery County. And again, look, uh, there's a Domestic Violence Coordinating Commission that exists in Montgomery County. Uh, we are honored to be a member of that commission. It is made up of all the different, a constellation of agencies that work on this issue in Montgomery County. It is well funded by Montgomery County government. Uh, if you live in Montgomery County, you, you should be proud of the longstanding tradition of the county executives and the county council to well fund efforts uh, to address issues of domestic violence. They've done that. And uh, again, we, we've tried to be creative. Well, uh, we have uh, besides the, the Family Justice Center, which we have again down here in Rockville, which is the, the hub for providing services to victims, is a national model. People travel from around the country, actually around the world, to see that model. And so we're very proud of, of what we're doing here in Montgomery County. Uh, but our work's not done. Uh, why is our work not done? Well, women lost their lives in Montgomery County last year. Women have lost their lives in Montgomery County this year. Uh, my favorite number when it comes to domestic violence is zero. Uh, I'm only going to be successful when we get to a situation where there are no victims of domestic violence. And certainly no one would lose their life as a result of domestic violence. 
And let me uh, let me ask you, um, State's Attorney John McCarthy, about the walk in their shoes display that is going to be uh, proliferated around the county and, and the importance of that. Well, there's a wonderful effort being made by the DVCC, the Domestic Violence Coordinating Commission, this year. And as part of their public awareness about uh, the need to address and for us to come together as a community to address domestic violence, they have these displays which are individual stories of different victims, and it, it, will, it basically identifies them by their first name. It tells you how old the victim is. and basically tells you on these displays those individual stories. And there are dozens of these uh, around the county, and what you have in front of the display is a pair of their shoes. And what we are challenging people to do is to read the stories, understand what's happening to people in our community, and kind of think about what would it be like to walk in the shoes of that person uh, who is suffering from domestic violence? Because uh, in some instances, you know, it might be a friend, a colleague or something that actually brings to our attention that there's a domestic violence situation. Most of, most of the time it does come from the victim themselves, but it's also because they have the support of people who care about them in the community, a friend, a neighbor, a loved one. And one of the things that was very, um, very troubling is the numbers when it comes to the, the number of young people who are now in situations where they're facing domestic violence, as well as the children who are witnessing domestic violence in their own homes. Well, you, you know, I, I, if I could just address the last part of that question first. I, I have been troubled for a very, very long time and worked on the original legislation that criminalized the, uh, an intentional act in a public area of committing an act of, of uh, domestic violence in front of a child. Uh, there are immediate victims, or there are immediate victims of domestic violence. That's the person who's assaulted, beaten, etc. Whatever the, the act is itself. But if children are around, I, I will tell you, we, we studies tell us these children are emotionally scarred. They carry the nightmares and the memories of watching their mother being beaten up by a boyfriend or a mom being beaten up by their dad, uh, and they carry those scars with them for the rest of their lives. When these bills were being uh, discussed in Annapolis years ago, and I went down and testified on behalf of them, I had some senior members of the legislature who had been in the uh, committee room when I testified, and they walked outside, and they said, John, let me tell you something. My dad used to hit my mom. I remember cowering in a corner or hiding in my bedroom or putting the pillow over my head. Uh, there are secondary victims, and sometimes those secondary victims. Well, that gonna, look, if you're a child and you've witnessed domestic violence, you carry it with you for the rest of your life. It's, and we hope it doesn't become learned behavior, too, because you know, we also see patterns within family lines. And so if you have learned domestic violence because that's the way you were brought up, that's the way life was in your house, well, that's another cycle we want to break. Through education. And let me ask you, because our, our time is so going so quickly, I don't want to leave before if people are listening today, uh, State's Attorney John McCarthy, who should they contact if they're listening, if they either have a friend or maybe it's them or maybe it is the young person? Well, I, let me say, you can always call the, the, the Montgomery County Police or the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department. They both have divisions that assist in domestic violence situations. There is a, there is a women's shelter. There is the Family Justice Center. You can, you can come to those locations. They're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're always available. Uh, if, if you are in need of assistance directly and you want to file a criminal charge, you can go uh, to, to multiple locations where there's a, a commissioner on duty to swear out the charges. If you just simply need a protective order where you don't want to proceed criminally, but you need to have your abuser removed from the family home, go to the commissioner's office. You'll meet with a commissioner. They will go through the legal protocol. If they find a basis for it, they will give you a temporary order, uh, ordering your abuser out of the house. And seven days later, you'll appear before a judge to see if you can't get that extended for a year, to, up to two years, I think, now in Maryland. Well, it's just such a deep issue, and we have already run out of our time. And I just want to thank my guest today. I've been speaking with Montgomery County State's Attorney John McCarthy about Domestic Violence and Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Thank you so much for joining me today on DMV Spotlight. Thank you very much. I'm Barbara Britt. Join us again next week at this same time for DMV Spotlight.